All right, uh, welcome. Uh, so, what I'm going to be talking about is slightly different, perhaps, from a devel developer's perspective. But closed source and software as a service, and looking at some of the legal aspects as well that can actually entrap you and some funny things around it. So, I'm just going to make sure that the clicker works and we should be good to go. Yeah, there we go. So first things first, slide numbers, bottom right corner. I will be walking around a bit and I will try to go through this uh, as efficient as possible. Uh, it's a fairly large subject. So save any questions for afterwards. I will be leaving ample time for questions and discussions afterwards. And uh, then something that's very important, especially uh, as I've been working for American companies before. I'm not a lawyer, I have no legal training, and I may actually be wrong a lot. So keep that in mind while you're listening to this. And if you have questions regarding it that might be affecting something like your customers, please go seek legal counsel. Don't just take my word for it, because you can get into deep waters with this. So I'm Marcus, I'm from Sweden live in a town called Uppsala, it's a university town. I'm married and we have a small child. And, well, I like computers. I like electronics and doing funny stuff with it. I worked a fair bit around the world for Microsoft, for electronic arts and dice, doing games, various things. But I also love open source that doesn't really compute all the time. So, <laughs> uh, back in, in September I joined uh, Knowit in Uppsala and here I am today. So, this talk might seem a bit odd, but as I've learned throughout the years working for these large co corporations and entities, every time we wanted to use something that was open source, we had problems because we had to go to legal, we had to get sign-offs and this took time. And I always wondered why. So I started to do some research a while back and see how, how is this even possible and why is this actually affecting me as a developer. And as our current political climate has taken a turn for whatever you want to call it, and US in itself having a fairly substantial amount of influence over software and how we consume software products, etc. I think this is important. And I also get to talk a bit about open source, so win-win for me. Uh, and as I mentioned, I really value open source and it's something that I want to push forward more and more. I think that's something that's going to be taking over more and more as well. We already see a lot of the open source stuff taking over. There's nothing that can compare to the Linux kernel when it comes to the amount of change that happens every day, day and night. So, I'm gonna be a little bit boring just for a few minutes. Since it has some legal subjects, it's also American, which means there's gonna be a few acronyms flying around. So, bear with me for a few minutes. We'll walk this through and hopefully you'll get as much as possible out of this talk, keeping these things in mind. So, we start easy. SaaS, right? Software as a service. Fairly straightforward. You rent software, you don't really physically own a copy of it. So, and you use other people's computers to execute on it at, at times as well. Ah, BIS. The Bureau of Industry and Security. Very sexy name. Uh, so, they deal with anything that's high technology, meaning encryption and things that can be used in a dual license way. And with that I mean it can be used in peacetime for good, but it can also be used for bad in, in wars, etc. Right? The CCL then is the Commerce Control List, and that lists a lot of the sensitive goods, etc. that may or may not be under export control from an American perspective. The EAR, which is the administration uh, for these regulations, uh, 
it's a very huge document that describes various things about this and it also adds a lot of exceptions and other things around it. The Office of Foreign Asset Control, they are the ones that are completely responsible for any and all kinds of economic sanctions that the US might actually uh, put into action. And that also means that all kinds of software export and software as a service are under their control. They can dictate and they can actually go charge companies if they do not play ball or adhere to any types of prohibitions or legal things in relation to this. <coughs> then we have the exemptions and the general licenses to make some things a little bit easier. There are various things listed as commodities, you would say. Like some types of software is always okay, but if it then combines and mixes other types of software, you might actually have to file a request to get it vetted, etc., by yourself. But with all types of rules and regulation in the US, First Amendment is always king. And that gives us some leeway, as we're going to see later in this talk. First Amendment is key here. Because personal internet and communications is protected under it, right? So that means internet access is fine, as long as you're using open source browsers to actually surf the web, etc. Doesn't matter what OFAC or the ear or anything else dictates or say, says, right? Water is good. <coughs> Sorry about that. So export laws. <coughs> oh yeah. <coughs> Still clings to the 20th century thinking, meaning physical goods, flying by train and moving a box of something, right? Doesn't really fit all that well with software, even less so with software as a service. So <coughs> it creates a lot of interesting legal dealings that actually affects us on a daily basis as developers, as content creators. And us and regulation then. So most software that performs, enables, leverages or do any kind of encryption is regulated. Right? And this means that if it's supplied within or from without, or from the US to the outside, you're regulated. So I don't think any one of us here are American, so we should be fine here. But if it incorporates US origin content or technology, now what does that actually mean? If I link a library that's American origin, I'm actually under US law now, export laws, just by linking a library or taking a dependency from a JavaScript library or something. This deals means we need to adhere to US export laws. No one really thinks about that and that's a bit scary because it's a lot of paperwork. <coughs> so. The legal requirements then, a non-US software SaaS company may actually be subject to this. It depends on how you deliver the software or how you consume other libraries or content in itself. You might actually be affected by this already now. Are you aware of anything? Can you think of something that you might actually have linked that's US origin based? Probably, right? It's quite common. The US is king on content. King on libraries, all the big software vendors come from there, one way or another, right? <coughs> so, I'm gonna try to tell you a story. I like Star Trek if it doesn't show from the slide. And this guy, Timothy, he loves Star Trek. So, between watching Star Trek, he writes his own best things about Star Trek. He rates episodes, movies, characters, you name it, he does it. Tim also likes computers, right? And Tim is fairly savvy at computers. So Tim is, thinks that, hey, 
I'm gonna create my personal website. Can't be that hard, right? So he starts to learn some basic HTML and stuff. Said and done, a few weeks later he has a static website that actually has his best quotes, his favorite episodes listed, etc. Right? Great, he publishes this to the world on the internet. Some months later, he starts to get emails from other Star Trek fans saying that, hey, your site is great, Timothy. I would like to contribute to this as well. Timothy thinks that, okay, that's cool. Maybe I can create something so others can also send in content, but I don't want that through email and then having to do this manual labor, right? So he creates a dynamic website, adds forum capabilities, you can vote on things, right? The regular stuff, fairly innocent, nothing fancy. This is very much appreciated by the community, so he gets a lot of visitors. The site grows and grows and grows, and it starts to get slow. What do you do in modern times when this happens? You want to scale, right? So you start to look at cloud solutions, AVS, Azure, you name it. So Timothy thinks that yeah, maybe I should actually scale this out and make sure that it actually can handle the load. And he also has a lot of people from around the world, Asia, US, etc. So even though he is financing this by his own means, he managed to pick Azure because it was the cheapest one for his use case. He adds a node in Eastern US, one in Asia Pacific, and one in Europe. Problem solved, right? Site loads and works, you have decent latency, etc. Everything's good. Some more time passes, and he gets more and more requests about actually being able to track on the go through mobile apps, etc. So, he writes an app as well. Publish that one to the Apple Store and to Google Play. Now everyone can also trek on the go. Now, in this scenario, I described a few things, right? The website, the scaling out in SaaS, or on Azure in this case, so we're using cloud computing, and a mobile application. How many problems does Tim have? At least two, right? So, this is also something that one seldom thinks about until you've read about it. Just by publishing an application to the App Store and Google Play, you are now have to adhere to American export laws. Because the servers you upload to is owned by Apple and Google, US-based companies. Their main servers are US-based. Whenever people from around the world download, you're exporting that binary from the US to whatever other country. Could this be problematic? We're gonna look at a few things that might happen later on. But I'm assuming that most people in this room wasn't aware or haven't even given it a thought, right? It's law and legal stuff. We're developers, we create stuff. We don't want to deal with this. <coughs> so, Software as a service as well, right? Anyone used Office 365? Probably. Fairly big. Some fairly obscure big company in the US making it. Prime example of software as a service that's widely used, right? Do you guys deliver or provide something that's a service? Are you hosting it somewhere? Are we hitting anything that might hurt? Do you feel something in your stomach that, oh, Shit, didn't think about that. You might actually also be under US law just by having the website as a software as a service. And by today's measurements, you most likely also have a mobile application or something that can talk to it through a web API or a desktop application, right? Now you also have a binary. This is key, the word binary. That gets distributed to other people companies. And this is a funny example. You write closed source software, right? You consume open source APIs. B 
be it encryption APIs or your link a library or something, like this is perfect fit for my business case and my use case. I'm gonna use this. Depending on where that originates, and especially if it's encryption, you will have US export laws to think about, even if it's open source. Because you're writing a closed source application, that's an entirely new entity that needs to go through BIS and other regulatory departments in the US for a sign off, normally. You can actually get hurt by this. If you're unlucky and they want to put pressure on you or your country, etc., you can actually face criminal charges for this. Not so fun. And then something else. So I tried the startup thing many, many years ago. Never succeeded. I'm not rich. So here I am. But we wanted to have investors, right? This is also something that can bite you if you want to start your own company. Make sure to know where you take your money, where you get the influence from. Because the obvious thing here is, sure, a US company buys you, you're going to be under US export laws, right? What's not as obvious, you get money from someone that's a US citizen or a company that's US based. If the amount is substantial enough, you might be under US law. Same thing, you hire this hot CEO or CTO or a few of them from the US or they are American citizens but they've been working in Europe for ages. They are still American citizens, US export law because they now have control over your company. They are the management team. So, what can actually happen for real? I have some things that's happened just during 2019 with what can actually happen here. So, GitHub got pressured by the US government to restrict developer ac accounts and access to their services for countries based in Iran, Crimea, etc. Right? There are countries that are under heavy sanctions already, such as Syria, Iran, North Korea, etc. Crimea, however, it's a disputed territory, right? Russia invaded and all of this. So now they also got sanctioned by the US. GitHub haven't really cared about this before. They've, they've done what any company do that tries to do most things open source, but since they also make money from this, they got pressured from the government that they need to strip access from these countries or they're going to face criminal charges and enormous amounts of money in penalties. So they had to do this. Developers in Crimea all of a sudden woke up from one day to another. They didn't have access to their open source code, their issue tracker, nothing. They were left in the water. And if they were paying for it as well, no refunds, no money back. You're just stripped of all access, nothing. Venezuela, this is interesting, an entire country. Now you probably heard about this on the news or read it in the newspaper or something, but the US wanted to try to force Venezuela to not be as corrupt. The US has its way to do things, which you might or might not agree with, but that's what happened. So they wanted to prohibit, it, prohibit almost all transactions and services between Venezuela and the US. Now, a country is fairly large, they might be using software, right? So what happened? Well, the government went to Adobe. Hey, they're using your software as a service. Creative Cloud is a prime example of software as a service, right? So it's fairly expensive as well. And if you're doing newspaper work or a TV studio, etc., you most likely kind of depend on some type of Adobe software, right? Now, a few days or a week after the government had published their new rules and exemptions and restrictions, they told them that you have up until the 20, 28th of October. Then anyone that's Venezuelan-based company, entity, or even end user can't use your software, or we're going to penalize you. So they had to really rush and hurry to try to actually make this happen. And said and done, 
all of a sudden from one night to another, people in Venezuela paying customers woke up, couldn't connect to Creative Cloud, they couldn't start Photoshop, InDesign, you name it. Because it's a software as a service, you don't own a physical copy of it, right? And it talks to servers so they can deactivate it at their will. Making it worse, no refunds, nothing. So if you were really unlucky, you had just renewed your subscription the day before, paid a lot of money, day after you can't use it, can't get a refund, you can't seek support or anything, you're dead in the water. That's a bit harsh, right? Now, how would this actually happen? General Provision 10 of the year states this. This is what you can do if they put an executive order or they make sure to otherwise pressure your country and they want to strip you of access to stuff. You can sell, transfer, export, re-export, finance, order, buy, remove, conceal, store, use, loan, dispose of, transport, forward or otherwise <coughs> service in whole or in part. This is why Adobe couldn't give refunds, etc. It's not that Adobe is the bad guys here. This is the law, the US export law. Problematic. Huawei is a fantastic example as well. <clears throat> Huawei have been doing some shady stuff, right? But they also do some very excellent stuff, like right? their mobile phones. Pretty nice phones, right? Huawei got blacklisted in May of 2019, and they were added to the US entity list. That's a separate list where they keep track of companies, specific individuals that the US government and any US origin company or individual can do business with. Kind of fine grained down to a specific individual, right? Don't really want to be on that list. <laughs> and making it a perfect storm, the president also signed an executive order banning all of Huawei's access to selling in the US. That also means that government facilities, etc., they can't use any Huawei equipment. They do 5G stuff as well as networking and a lot of things is Huawei based, right? Not only the consumer stuff we see. So, looking at the consumer aspect, it's easiest here. They do uh, phones, right? They ship them with Android on them. Government went to Google and said, hey, we have this new ban in place. You need to strip them of access to any and all of Google's Android code, etc., so they can't update or sell their phones with that operating system. Now, that might hurt Huawei, but it also hurts worldwide because no end user of a Huawei phone then knew if they were going to get any new security patches, updates, or anything, right? Was the phone going to turn into a brick? And so this is the far reach of US export laws. It touches any and all of us, whether we like it or not. And does it seem far-fetched? For me, before I started to research this and really understood the means of this, it felt like completely alien. It, they can't touch me, I'm just a single developer doing God knows what. Looking more closely to home then. Denmark, Finland, Norway and Sweden, who all classify as something called Group A countries, fulfilling something called A1 to A5. It's a matrix where they have certain technologies, competences, etc. And we check all of these. Some of the highlights is the Vassanar participating state, meaning it's a global export and control thingy where head of states meet and discuss and agree on things. Missile technology, control regime, yes, we can fire missiles, we can wage war in a fairly sophisticated way, but we also sell and help US fight air wars. We also supply a lot of nuclear materials. Hey, peaceful Sweden, Denmark, Finland and Norway. Um, 
It also means that the US thinks quite highly of us, right? It's not a problem for any US based entity or company to sell license or in other ways facilities, facilitate us in actually using software or services or anything, right? And we're quite happy with that. We seem to love Microsoft stuff, for example, Adobe stuff. So we're using this room. We're good friends, the US and us. But what would actually happen if we weren't all that good friends? And I've been thinking about this for a while. And with the climate we're in currently, and the likelihood of something like this actually being possible and could occur is bigger than ever. So I'm going to try to describe a scenario here and see what you guys think as well. The president wakes up one morning. He has this very pressing issue where he wants to do a specific thing. The president wants to do something and he wants to use the Nordic countries as a way of putting pressure and force us to help us further his agenda, right? Could be quite possible. Happened before, at least in Sweden. I have several documented cases where we're helping FBI and CIA with stuff that we really shouldn't be involved in. Now, here comes the fun part. We really don't want to play ball. We really can't adhere to what he wants us to do. So we say no. Now, the president, or at least his staff, isn't all that stupid, so they're going to go and see what they can actually use against us to actually force us or bully us into submission here, right? So let's take the prime example of software. If we can't buy or license stuff in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, in Sweden, what would happen? How would our society actually look? No software that's made from the US anywhere. You can't link or use anything. You won't get updates. Windows Update will stop working. Perhaps your PC won't reboot as frequent, so that's good, perhaps. Um, you won't be able to purchase more licenses. You have what you have for now. Would that sting a bit, perhaps? No access to GitHub. Anyone using that? I do. That would be quite a sucky day to wake up. Not being able to access my own code, contribute to my favorite open source project. No Office 365. Would know it function well without Office 365? <laughs> I think we're going to have a problem here. Now Windows, maybe, thing is, you can still use what you have, right? You won't get any updates, etc. so you probably don't want to use it after a few weeks at least. No access to Android or iOS, meaning no updates, etc. You still have what you have, no updates. You won't be able to use the stores to download new content or new applications. Kind of a useless phone then, right? Because no one uses it to call anymore anyway. <laughs> now Google Drive, now Dropbox, now OneDrive. It would sting a bit as well, right? Now Azure, now AWS, now DigitalOcean or Linode, if you sell for VPSs, for example. American based. Can't use that service. And it goes on like this. So much in our digital lives as developers and as office workers, is run by US-based software. The US is almost in total control here. They can really hurt us because we're so dependent on these American-based software. Now, everything isn't all that dark. There are saving graces, open source and free software. Remember what we talked about in the beginning, right? First Amendment protects information, free speech, internet communication. How is open source distributed? Not like a binary, right? It's source code. And just as something, as a refresher, if you don't remember, open source comes in many names and shapes and forms. 
can be free software, Libre, Libre software, Foster Floss, etc. Right? And my favorite thing here is free software actually came before open source because you had free software long before open source started with Stallman in 82-ish, something like that, right? But it's also the term free software. Usually people think, oh, it's free, like in free from paying, but it actually means free as in freedom. You can do anything with the software, you can redistribute it. You can throw it in the water if you like. Do whatever you like, it's up to you. And as I don't know many of you, I don't know what you guys think when you heard the term free or open source. Is it like you want to come up and punch me for just being bad, not wanting to use closed source, Microsoft and Windows is the best that's ever been made, or is it like, oh, this is good, maybe I could use this, or yeah, I'm open source, I contribute to the kernel, this is the best thing ever. It varies quite widely, right? Everyone has their own interpretation of what it actually means because it's so personal. You can make it whatever you want. That's the beauty with open source. Change it, use it however you like. And tying back to this, the documentation and the lists and the laws all tie back to this. For free or at a price that does not exceed the cost of reproduction and distribution. Sounds a bit like free software, right? Source code may be exempt from regulation as information or informational materials, whereas compiled software would not meet the terms of this exception. Open source, you have access to the source code, you can distribute the source code, you can build it on your own machine. But if you shift it as a binary, you get problems, even if it's, even if it's open source, right? So, now we go into the section where I get to talk about things I really, really like versus legal things. So, with this knowledge, we have a few alternatives, right? There's a lot of open source software, but we're going to have to start with something. We need to be able to boot our computer and have an operating system. Linux sits pretty well with me. Probably you guys are using Linux at least on the server to deploy your web apps and whatnot, right? So, desktop it is. Open source applications, there's many, many, many of them. They also replicate and replace and even does a better job in some, some cases for office work and developer tools and whatnot, right? And you can still access internet, but you might not be able to go to certain sites because they are blocking you on an IP-based range, etc. And since we're under sanctions, we won't be able to access like IMDB or Hollywood's latest news or whatever, but who gives a crap about that anyway? But it's a reality. And me as a developer and a few of you here as well as developers, hopefully you're already using some of these tools, like the desktop and the server using Linux or BSD, or at least OpenBSD. Should be fine. We can make do with that. We can create stuff. Doesn't have to be Windows. You can use GCC, Clang, and Python, .NET Core, Open, JDK, etc. to do our favorite things, write applications in our favorite languages, and deliver things. Tooling such as VM and Eclipse, etc. is also open source and freely available. You can use them on Windows already now as well, right? So, now comes the hard part. Your customers, what do they actually expect to run things on? With this scenario in place, they don't really have an option, right? So they're gonna have to move or stay on something that's getting older and older and just falls apart in itself, right? So we should really push more for the open development model also to our customers because not only us can get free from this, it's also helping our customers to not be knowingly or most likely unknowingly being stuck in this net where they are more vulnerable than they have to be, right? Whoops. No. No. 
That was a useless piece of mouth mat. <laughs> no, let's go to the backup. <coughs> so there's also the first line workers, right? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, and when it comes to the back end, we're getting quite used to deploying to Azure and AVS, etc., right? But since that wouldn't be an option as well, the only reasonable thing I actually see in this scenario is that you have to go back and do on-prem servers, etc. You're going to have to host stuff yourself. There's no other way around it. Maybe not as sexy, but still cloud computing is just someone else's computer. Just take the computer and put it in your own office again. Problem solved, right? <coughs> and as we're talking about customers and ourselves as well, Regular office work, right? Not everyone is a developer. There are replacements for Outlook and everything, right? You guys already know this, hopefully, but you can use LibreOffice for replacing Word and Excel and PowerPoint and all of that, right? Works fairly okay. This is done on it. And it's not the fault of the program that my slides look like they are. It's just that I'm graphically incapable. So <laughs> I've tried my hardest, but this is what I got. Uh, Thunderbird for emailing and Firefox browsing the web, right? All open source, all works, fairly heavily used, right? But now, encryption. Any good piece of software requires encryption nowadays, unless you're doing something very trivial or something seriously flawed. You should encrypt your data to keep your data safe from not only yourself, but governments and all of that. So, this is a wall of text, but the key thing here is ECCN 5D002. It's like being back to school. Hardly understand what I'm talking about. Uh, so this is some legal talk uh, about how encryption classifies. And as I mentioned before, open source encryption and linking that to closed source binaries that wasn't such a good idea, right? But if you're doing open source and you're doing open source encryption, which most encryption is, this has apparently also run out of batteries. Something weird with the error here in Bergen, perhaps. Uh, so I'm gonna do this then. Hopefully it's somewhat visible. We're gonna zoom in a little bit, but everything that's green on the left side is open source. So the majority of things look good, right? So we're gonna zoom in a bit. So, OpenSSL, you probably use that one way or another, hopefully. Uh, Nazi and Libsudium and GNU TLS, etc. All of this is open source implementation, right? So you can use it freely, which also means it doesn't fall under the US export laws, as long as you don't link it to a closed source binary. So we should be fairly good there. And encryption, when I talk about it, with other people less tech savvy or people in general that just gonna take a, make a decision and don't fully understand the technology. I usually get this fairly often. So I thought I'll add this here as well because I find this quite important. So an open source algorithm for encryption. Everyone can read the code, right? Versus a closed source implementation. What would be the safest thing? If you ask someone on the street that doesn't really know computers, they're gonna by default think that, oh, they think that I can't read, that's not gonna be a much harder to crack, right? Well, unfortunately, it's the opposite. Anything that's closed source is usually cracked much, much more faster. And that depends on this. I have a guy that's called Bruce, or I have a guy. I read what a guy writes, Bruce Schneier, he's, an excellent guy when it comes to computer security and mathematics and stuff like that. He has a very nice blog. You should go read it if you haven't. But this I try to use when I answer this question. Every secret creates a potential failure point, right? Secrets, in other words, is a prime cause of brittleness and therefore something likely to make a system prone to catastrophic collapse. Conversely, 
openness provides tactility. Think about that for a moment. If you, as an individual, wants to create something to encrypt or, or cipher or hide information, you can very well create that fairly easily so that you may not be able to crack it. But ingenuity of human beings and crowds means that as long as someone else looks at how your cipher etc. works, they're going to find cracks in it no matter what. And that's the key point here. The openness provides tactility. The more eyes watching and looking at the code, the more sure you can be that it actually holds up and that it's safer and it works as intended, and then that there's no back doors like NSA weakening the RSA crypto, right? So, yeah, I need to click. Huh? Some real world examples then. And yeah, I'm not using Windows, but I thought if someone were falling asleep, they might want to see a friend. Uh, so, Cuba, they've been under heavy sanctions by the US since like forever, sometimes in the 50s. That's why time looks like the 50s when you visit Cuba. Because that was the last time they could actually buy American made cars, etc. legally. And they got really good at actually repairing and maintaining those things. So it looks amazing when you're in Cuba. But Cuba, as so many other repressed regimes, etc., have a lot of intelligent people. So that means that when you visit Cuba, you get all the latest American-made TV shows, movies, and everything, even before they air in the cinemas in the US at times. It's quite amazing. And the funny part is, the American government, they can't do anything about it because they're sanctioned, so they can't be involved or put pressure on Cuba. So they're free to do this as much as they want, they can pirate the shit of anything that's American made. It's free for all. That also means that they have like old school sneaker nets of people running with USB keys, delivering the latest movies and TV shows for the week around neighborhoods. This has gotten so big that there are actually companies now in Cuba specializing and making money on this to distribute pirated content. It's amazing. The Hollywood folks are not super pleased with this, and they can't do anything. I find this, that to be so amazing. And looking at their computers and their IT solutions, etc., funny enough, they run a lot of Windows stuff. Pirated Windows. The government runs pirated Windows. The companies run pirated Windows. And Office, and Adobe, and all of this, right? US can't do anything because they're sanctioned. They can't be associated or put pressure on them. But a few years ago, US and Cuba wanted to try to improve on this situation and ease some of the sanctions and restrictions from the US in return for Cuba trying to not, at least in the government, pirate and run pirated software, right? So the Cuban government came up with the idea that we're going to create something called Nova Linux. And that's to create sovereignty and technology independence and not pirate so much stuff. So they have actually rolled this out with a fairly good success rate, I would say. So companies or and the government themselves use and run this and it's spreading in the population as well. And it's for the general Cuban national, it's fairly hard to get a working Windows version that hasn't been hacked or leaked or whatever, right? Because it's going to be unsafe. So they tend to go to this solution as a good option. Prime example of how you can use open source and Linux for good. If a country can do this and use it, we as developers and as a company should also be able to raise open source a little bit more. Another example, North Korea. They have Red Star. Now this is a different beast. Not everything can be done for good. You can also use it for bad, right? 
So it's internally developed, state sponsored, both desktop and server. It actually looks really good. If you, you can go in and vic at Wikipedia and see some screenshots, etc., from leaked versions. But they've been quite ingenious as well, but in a bad way. As in Cuba, North Korea also have problems with Western media being spread, like movies, prints, etc. And they want to punish those that actually spread this. So in the kernel for Red Star, they've written a few model modules and they've modified it so every time you write to a USB, they watermark the data so they can track it to the origin that wrote it first. That way, when they find one of these USBs, they capture the one carrying it, then they can use the watermark to trace it back to the individual that initially wrote it. Pretty cool tech, all it's being used to punish people and God knows what more. Also, a fairly cool example, if you don't look at the punishment thingy. So, I'm actually quite good on time. What have I actually learned here, or what I hope you've learned, or at least put some fragments here when you walk out of this room. Please don't rely on only closed source and proprietary software. There's so much more outside. And if you want to try to stay out of problems and legal things when it comes to US export laws, if you're starting your own company or you have customers that's small or our government, we should really push for open source here. And do not assume anything. That JavaScript library that you pull in, do you know what that in itself pulls in? Is it kosher? Is it safe to use? Or will that, by just, it's just a benign library, right? Would that actually come back and hunt you in an eventual future? This was one of the key problems we had at DICE and EA and Microsoft. That's why it took so much time for us to be able to use certain open source things. Even the smallest thing was vetted and evaluated by the legal team. Because this could really get back and bite us. Because we exported our games worldwide, right? So we had to be really, really careful. And we're not US citizens. Even what you're doing as an individual could actually end up meaning that you are under US export laws. Think about that the next time you're writing code or linking a library. Could this actually hurt me or the customer even worse? Because who's gonna be responsible? You or us as know it or the customer? Who should know this and who should have the legal know-how? I think we, when we deliver to our customers, needs to be better at this is safe or you need to think about this. And use more open source. It doesn't get any easier than that. If you use open source, you can just completely wipe most of what I've told you about here today because it falls away with that. That's it. Questions? Yes. So, well, I know you're not a lawyer, but in your experience, <laughs> how infectious is the problem with the uh, American domain? Uh, if I accidentally started using a library and then realized my mistake and, uh, and then tried to pull it out again, how infectious is it? Do I have to start from scratch or can I just you know, stop and uh, do I have to give it back to my software before? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to try to repeat the question so we get it on camera as well. So if I understand the question correctly, how infectious is this if you link a library into your existing software? And if something were to happen, how would I roll back and recover from it? Right? Yeah. So I'm going to try to answer it based on what I've read. So if you link a library, you export your software to customers and paying customers, etc., and it's closed source. If the government or OFAC and BIS, etc., goes after you for some reason, you're going to be penalized by a huge sum of money. 
and they're gonna give you a period of time to try to rectify how you would do that I have no idea uh, this is also why we especially at EA was super we hardly linked any type of open source stuff I called it the syndrome of not invented here but that was actually for a good reason we had to do some clean room implementations on certain things because otherwise we could get into trouble yes good question anyone else yes are we even under US jurisdiction that's a different thing I think so I'm not a lawyer so the difference between I think it depends it depends on what you're doing with your software right and I can't really give you a good answer on that hopefully you have some legal counsel you can talk to <laughs> yes so now the EAR they are kind of uh, not interested it's not covering touching the open source uh, software but that's something that I think they could quite easily change so let's include everything also open source here yep. what would be the implication so here comes the problem uh, I'm gonna summarize your question so EA could change this right and they could then um, start using more open source and the question is how would they uh, go about I, I to do mean, it uh, they, uh, because uh, they are kind of making their laws or the US is making their own laws their export laws for example so they should just they could just change it that okay this cover uh, um, this includes also open source yeah okay so what would happen if the US also changed their export laws to also include open source yes. that would not be possible because you have the first amendment first amendment is always king they will never ever ever touch that so that's why I can with confidence say that open source is your best bet if you want to try to avoid this mess right yeah yes yeah. So I love the uh, open source uh, stuff in general, uh, but open source is not open source. It's not open source. It's not necessarily same as free software. Make sure that the details and the license don't affect your software and limits your uh, abilities. Yes. So I'll repeat the point. Make sure to double check any kind of open source license you may be relying on there is multiple of them they are some that's more free than others so if it's LGPL 2 or 3 or MIT etc make sure that those licenses align with your interests perfect thank you yeah I guess that's it and we're on time I'm extremely satisfied with being on time <laughs> okay and feel free to come grab me if you have any questions that you didn't want to ask now or if you just want to talk open source or just want to know how it is to make games for AAA studios or whatever it's not as fun as it sounds I promise you <laughs> uh, or anything else I'm more than happy to sit down and talk and answer questions and find new friends as I'm very new to know it in general yeah thank you